<clears throat> Hello. I am Jay Freeman, uh, but everyone online knows me as Sorek. Uh, a lot of people at 360 iDev tend to know me as that crazy jailbreak guy. Uh, <laughs> Today I'm here to talk to you about something that I actually end up showing a lot during my talks. Uh, it's called script. So one of the things that I, I kind of realize, and uh, I mean I, I say like, I realize this, uh, I come to 360 iDev, I give a lot of talks, I tend to pull things apart, show how things work. Uh, in the process of doing so, I'm in essence the magicians on stage doing a bunch of awesome tricks. Um, sometimes they're impressive, sometimes they're just interesting, sometimes you know they're a little bit very boring actually because I'm doing a bunch of coding and I don't oftentimes prepare the exact code that I'm typing ahead of time. Um, but in the end, people go home and they tell stories of the talk that they heard, uh, but they don't actually get to do any of the tricks that they saw while they were at the show. So my goal today is I'm finally able to give you something that you can download onto your computer today and you should be able to do all the stuff that I'm doing uh, and be able to get like play with this thing. Uh, and by this thing, I mean script. And of course, um, this is my boomstick uh, in order to refer to uh, Colin's talk from yesterday. All right, so this, this really weird URL here, um, if, you, if, if people could download this, if you're actually at all interested in doing something in the audience right now, um, that, uh, that will download a zip file, uh, extract that zip file, and uh, go into the zip file. And then there's a console program, which is a little shell script thing that actually wraps a real console program I mean, technically, you could take those files and install them somewhere, but I kind of set it all up so you didn't have to. Um, there's also a framework. You can ignore that for now. It'll come up later. Um, yeah, it's not that large. It's only three megabytes. Anyone here still needs this URL on the screen? No. All right. So, with all of the awesome jailbreak stuff that we have, um, so initially, so I can have the simulator on screen, but I can also have my actual phone on the screen. And this is done using a VNC server that's running on the phone. Uh, it's not what I'm talking about today, but I'm just mentioning that when you see this screen, that's actually my phone. That's not like another simulator or anything. Um, and it's actually surprisingly zippy, actually. Um, but, okay. And I'm currently attached, and which is something that also a lot of other people can do if they um, to do some of these steps. Um, not this first step, because this first step involves a jailbroken phone. Um, but um, I'm currently attached via tethering, just normal tethering to my phone. When you're attached via tethering, there's a little private network that gets constructed, um, and you can just you can't SSH to your phone. But if you have a socket server running on your phone, of some uh, pen. If you have some kind of socket server running on your phone, you can connect to it using the IP address, which is the phone's gateway. Uh, and if we look at uh, if config, we have somewhere here, here we go. Um, like you might be 172.2010.5, the phone is 172.2010.1. Um, so if we ever need the IP address of the phone, that's how you can get it. Um, does that make sense? All right. If I say things that don't make sense, please yell at me. Because uh, I am very apt to accidentally do that, um, and uh, I'm trying to like give you information you can actually do. So if you end up missing or misunderstanding something, then we're just kind of screwed. Um, <laughs> uh, feel free to throw things at me. I mean, hopefully not heavy things. <laughs> um, all right. This prompt, when you see this one, that's that's actually my phone. You can't do that unless you have a jailbroken phone. If you do, awesome. Um, but this prompt is when I have to say to my phone. This prompt is when I'm sitting at my computer. Um, so it's essence when I'm when I'm a little squiggly root or when I'm the uh, script uh, dollar sign. And actually, by the way, I did turn off almost every kind of notification except for 360 iDiv ones. So if anyone here wants to spam us, with <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So what is script? So um, in 2009, I came to 360 iDev, and I was scheduled to give an eight-hour-long, all-day workshop. Uh, and I was actually super excited about doing this workshop, uh, but when I arrived here, I had, uh, I had pneumonia. And I ended up actually doing the second half of the workshop with pneumonia, um, but during the first half, I mean, I actually went to urgent care and got some antibiotics, and I was kind of sick the whole rest of the time. And actually, very much thank you to Tom, who actually lent me his room the first night due to <laughs> uh, mis uh, misallocations on hotels. 
Um, I was sick, though, that entire trip, and I couldn't really, but it was kind of like a walking pneumonia, so I had an opportunity to do something that is arguably very boring, um, that, like, wouldn't require a lot of thought that might give me a headache, but at the same time, I was, like, totally wanting to do things, and so I took that opportunity to type up something I've been wanting for a while, which is a complete JavaScript grammar um, in Bison, um, with all of the kinds of hooks I would need to get an abstract, abstract syntax tree, etc. Um, now, why do I want a JavaScript uh, grammar? So we actually have to go back a little bit further. Um, so uh, people tend to know me as this guy who makes Cydia, which is the alternative to the apps for on jailbroken phones. Uh, but when I first got involved in jailbreaking, uh, I actually was the guy who did the JVM for the device. I didn't, I didn't code the JVM. I poured an existing JVM. But what I did do is I made a tool that took an Objective-C framework and outputted a Java jar file that you could then do a bunch of bridging magic through something I wrote called Jockstrap. Java Objective C Bootstrap, um, <laughs> uh, in order to build applications, uh, and so the uh, we you can actually build a full application using using the Java stack. There were many things about it that that kind of stuck, uh, and uh, I don't I don't attempt to maintain that particular like thing today. But what ended up being really cool about it is, is that you could take Rhino, a Java JavaScript uh, implementation, and then run that in Jockstrap, and then get access to all of the Objective-C classes. And you had access to all of them, not just anything that Apple provided. Well, actually, at the time I was doing this, Apple didn't provide an SDK. So it was the main way that I was able to sit around and explore the frameworks was by doing this JavaScript console, testing stuff, and seeing what it did. And I always thought that was really, really slow, running through the Rhino implementation on top of this horrible JVM that wasn't really designed for this kind of use case, didn't have any JIT or anything. Um, through, through like multiple layers of like, you're going from JavaScript to Java, from Java to Objective-C, it was just really bad. Um, I always thought it'd be really cool if I could have something that was more native, that worked directly on JavaScript core. Hence, why I wanted to build a JavaScript grammar, so that then I could, um, well, actually, like, that's, not, that's not really a hence, is it? So, <laughs> um, but I, there, were, there, uh, there were a bunch of things that made, it was really irritating typing into, the, uh, into, into JavaScript. And so I wanted to be able to um, extend some of the language features in order to make it easier to manipulate Objective-C. Hence the JavaScript grammar. When I finally got around to building that grammar, that was when I really now had the ability to put all these pieces together, and I built script. So to me, like, script is kind of a 360 IDEF project. I tend to use it in all of my demos here. I tend to work on it. If you look at my commit history, it's like the middle of September. Suddenly there's this massive swath of commits as I, <laughs> I start adding functionality. Uh, and so here, I'm, I'm really happy to be able to say that, like, and everyone here at 360iDev, you get to download it and use it on your computers. This is something that has not previously been supported. Uh, occasionally, for like a few weeks, you can download it and run it on your Mac. That usually rots very quickly. Um, it's occasionally worked in the iOS simulator. That usually doesn't last. I mean, that usually is just like a one-off build I managed to construct, uh, um, like, almost by hand, like, sitting at the hex, right? And it's just, it was, um, now I've got it, um, the build that you can download from that URL, um, it will work on uh, Mac OS 10.6 uh, through 10.9, it'll work on iOS 2 through iOS 7, and it'll work uh, targeting um, all the stuff with the simulator, at least the iOS 5 simulator, the iOS, actually, at least the iOS 6 simulator, um, I think it'll work on the iOS 5 simulator. And if you guys test it on a simulator and it doesn't work, an older one, I'm willing to try to fix it, but I imagine that people aren't going to try working on an older simulator. <laughs> um, the, it should work on the iOS 5 simulator. Um, it will work on the iOS 7 simulator. All right. So, one thing that we're going to need to do, though, is we're going to need to kind of jailbreak your SDK, unless you have the new one. So, if you go under Applications, uh, Xcode, Contents, Developer, so this is where all of your, like, tool chains and, and like, platform environments are. Under Platforms, iPhone OS Platform, so this is where the iPhone OS, like, um, uh, specific, um, like, uh, header files and... Uh, uh, tool chains typically are uh, developer again developer again then we go under uh, SDKs iPhone OS 6.1 SDK system library frameworks uh, I have here a sim link for JavaScript core this sim link points into the private frameworks for JavaScript core. It's just going to make it so it's really easy to use JavaScript core from Xcode. So um, inside of that folder, however, Apple doesn't uh, provide header files. So I link the headers folder to the system 
copy of JavaScript core headers because they are totally compatible. Okay? So you might not have to do this in an upcoming version of iOS, but for the version that I'm going to be doing all these demos with on screen today, we have to make this one modification, and then suddenly Xcode is going to be very happy doing all of our crazy JavaScript core stuff. And again, that's just in the SDKs for the iPhone 6.1 folder, in the normal public frameworks folder, adding a symlink for JavaScript core to the private one, and then adding a symlink from the headers for the JavaScript core to the system copy of JavaScript core. Does that not make sense to anyone? Okay. Get out of there. All right. So, what is script? Script is a command line program. If you run it, um, you should get a side pound prompt. This prompt is a little bit like if you're using node.js or something. It's a read eval print loop for JavaScript. Uh, it also, however, has really awesome like live syntax highlighting of the things that you type. But it's actually, because I did the whole JavaScript grammar myself, it's an extension of JavaScript. So whereas if you normally were to have, for instance, an array with uh, specifically used crazier numbers, uh, two numbers in it, and you were to do for bar i in b system dot print i, you get the indexes. So you end up having to do like b of i if you want to get the numbers. Some versions of JavaScript, such as JavaScript 1.8, has a for each command. JavaScript core does not. So how do I do that? If I put in debug mode, we can now see that I recompile what I typed into lower level JavaScript, like ECMAScript, uh, I think even three compatible JavaScript, uh, for execution on JavaScript core. And this is something that we're going to look at the debug output occasionally as we switch into crazier and crazier script syntax to see how this actually works. All right. Script itself is written in C++ almost entirely. There's a very small amount of Objective C++ um, that provides a few categories onto um, core uh, uh, foundations, not, not core foundations, but on the core foundation classes, <laughs> um, such as uh, NS uh, object, NS array, et cetera. Uh, scripts code, so if you go to script.org, and by the way, that's how I pronounce it. It's the CY, the Geminid S. I don't care how you pronounce it, though. If you say sidecrypt or whatever, it's fine. I don't, I don't like it. But if you're curious, I pronounce it script. Um, but so if you go to script.org, um, there's a link to the Git repository this kind of stuff works. Um, OK. So script provides a bunch of bridging logic down to C. So I can say malloc, and I will get back the address of the malloc function on my computer. And if I bar t is equal to malloc of 4, I will get back a pointer. I can then. Free that pointer. And of course, just like you can see, I still know where the pointer was in case I want to try to use it, which is probably not a good idea. Script is not safe. Script is not trying to be safe. There. <laughs> Eventually, we'll cause it to crash. Um, All right. Um, the this kind of bridging is just done by providing uh, functions in the uh, in the like script JavaScript runtime that um, will bridge out to these functions. Um, but it's actually fairly generic. So if I were to, for instance, want to find this function, so who here has used DL sim? Two people. Wow. Okay. <laughs> uh, DL sim is something that will allow you to look up a symbol by name. Um, so you can use this to, for example, um, find the address of a function if only you know its name. RTLD default malloc. There's its address. Now I want to call it. So first I'm going to have to construct an adapter for it that um, takes the correct arguments. Um, and so all of the uh, encodings here are standard Objective-C um, type encodings. But we'll see a cooler way of doing that in a sec. Um, uh, so it returns pointer to void, and it takes a uh, long integer of some unsigned long integer, I think. Um, and equal to that. And now if I call and allocate six bytes of memory, I get my bytes of memory. This is all done using libffi. It's all done very dynamically. OK. Um, I also, however, bridge a bunch of syntax. So if I want to, for instance, um, take, I just want to like, declare, um, like, well, in this case, like, if I want to do the, um, this type encoding, 
in, John, in Objective-C, you can use encode, and you can pass it something like void pointer, and that'll work. Uh, and we're going to get back a type object, which, if you attempt to convert it to string, will be the pointer to void. So you can take an encoded void pointer, you can add an encoded... Uh, unsigned long actually might not be valid, but u long will be valid. u long, and it'll get back the, uh, the same encoding. Now, u long is actually just a variable. And so, if I say var t is equal to u long, and then I ask for the encoding of a t pointer, I'm going to get back a pointer to an unsigned long. Because I'm actually just kind of bridging this all back through, you know, really weird dynamic sense back through JavaScript. All right. I can take one of these types, like u long, and I can make a new one. And that'll also allocate one. And now, I can indirect it and set it equal to a. How the hell does that work then? All right, so, debug. There is a special variable I add to pointer types, C1, pound, C, sorry, dollar $CYI, which allows me to indirect them. That's all like, like um, hidden behind syntax sugar, however, for users. You don't actually ever use dollar $CYI. Instead, you just use the star operator. Okay. With all of this added syntax now, I can start going really crazy with my added syntax, and I can also start doing really awesome things bridging Objective-C. So, NS object. I should turn off the button. NS object. I'm going to get back the NS object class. I want a new one of those. Uh, what can I actually do? I can uh, alloc. I get back a new NS object. I use Objective-C syntax to do this. This is getting compiled down at the JavaScript layer, like before it goes to the JavaScript interpreter, to OBJC MSG send calls. Um, the uh, it's using cell register name. By the way, you can use uh, selector if you want to get selectors. It'll compile down to cell register name. Um, and then running that, and there's um, bridging for OBJC, MSG send, etc. Uh, and it handles all of the types in some hilariously automatic way in order to allow you to get access to whatever variables you're looking at. It'll then attempt to print some kind of description of it on the console. Now, weirdly enough, this variable I actually need to release if I, when I'm done using it. And the reason why is because I'm just bridging Objective-C very raw here with NS object alloc. You actually allocate it. If you call retain a bunch of times, like I actually let you do that. Um, this is really designed to be more of a debugging console that you can use in order to do low-level manipulations of something with some kind of, like, um, with, with all of the syntax. It's, um, so uh, if you want, however, to have more automated memory management, you can use new NS object. And this will um, just get a reference to it. It'll auto, it'll like in essence internally auto release it in a way that it'll it'll keep track of it only at the JavaScript level. Uh, I can you know initialize variable um, write my own object. All right. What else can I do to an NS object? Um, you know tab completion is something people really like. Tab completion is something I really like. Um, you know if I type NS object, I actually do tab completion on that. Um, but you know, these high-level things, you tab completion, that's fine. What if you have, like, a string, like, uh, hello dot, you want to, like, uh, tab complete dot, whoa, that one not work. That one doesn't work because that's not iterable. You actually don't know at runtime that it has a dot t string. That's an interesting problem. <laughs> I should think about that. But to demonstrate, though, just how, like, this one here, right, there's no way in hell it can tab complete that. It does. <laughs> So I do grammar assisted tab complete, um, and the, the tab completion will use the runtime in order to do tab completion. And that's why the string tab complete isn't working, because I will take the part of the object you're actually the part of the command you're actually trying to manipulate, I will instantiate it, like I will execute it. I will then take the object that results, I will iterate over all the stuff that it has, and I will look for um, fields, methods, etc., and then I will allow you to uh, tab complete them. So I, I think the issue is that if you look at the prototype of string, it doesn't actually have a two string on it. It's a hidden, non-enumerable uh, prototype. So like if I were to do like four bar i in this, it wouldn't show up. And that's why it doesn't tab it. Okay. But back to this, I can tab complete all the messages that I can do to an NS object. If I do something that is more complicated and I tab complete, it'll tab complete the rest of it. And it will carefully avoid, no matter how complicated this is, it'll succeed in parsing out, tab completing out to here, it'll execute this part of the code only, figure out what it needs to do in order to get all the things, knows that the context to so far is this part, and it'll tab complete the rest. All right. Um, 
So when you, you okay, so as far as like trying to like bridge a bunch of stuff, okay, so like I've been doing some of these things and I get back these objects. Um, so I can, for instance, do a new, well, let's say uh, NS array, array with object. Uh, I'm going to use an at string there. I'm going really to use an at string there in order to get an objective C string. I'm going to construct an array. I'm going to get back an objective C array. With my objective C array, and by the way, um, underscores to get the last thing you, the last thing that got executed. I can still, however, use uh, JavaScript like uh, bracket notation. I can also slice. Yeah, I can also get. I can also call JavaScript functions on it as if it were a JavaScript array, because the a, uh, an objective C array instance of JavaScript array is true. It's also, by the way, instance of NS array. I've kind of merged the object hierarchies together in a way that allows you to like mix and match the semantics of, of the things you're doing. If you have an object, uh, sorry, a JavaScript array, and you would like to do object at index, it'll tab complete as you're going through it and pull our element out. Really enough, you're going to get back an objective C6 because you called an objective C method on a JavaScript object <laughs> in order to get back a number. All right. <laughs> um, are there any other crazy bridging tricks I need to do? I don't think so. Okay. You also are able to do um, to declare uh, to to add categories to existing objects or existing classes. So if I say uh, at implementation ns object of you know I give it like a category name and then uh, description. I'm not going to bother specifying the return type by the way. Uh, return hello. And now I say NS object new, I get back hello, because the description of, a, of an NS object is now hello. Okay, how did it get the return type of that? It uh, automatically figured it out because the return type, um, because the method already existed. Um, I can also, though, declare new types. Actually, okay, so let's uh, reset so we undo that chain. Implementation um, A derives from NS object as a description return hello. Let's say I want to add something else to it, like a test. Well, if I add something that's not something that's already there, I'm going to have to give it a return type. We've already seen that script has a lot of cool bridging for return types, so I can just put it in here. So let's see what happens if I return a string. And uh, syntax error, what am I missing? Uh, yes, you're correct. I actually did make this required. Okay. So, new A, test 6. Get back the number that I anticipated because I specifically specified the return type of int. Okay. Um, blocks. <laughs> uh, so, if I want to do, like I've got a 7, 8, 100. Enumerate objects with no. Anyone know what it's called? Thing enumerates with block. Enumerates objects using block. Okay. I should have just tab complete more. I should, I'm not doing that. <laughs> got this beautiful tab completed. I'm asking the audience for using one of my free. <laughs> Next time I'm gonna have to phone a friend. That's gonna take so much longer. All right. Uh, so I can use block syntax. The only caveat is that um, the block gets constructed um, before it gets past this thing, and uh, in the infinite irritation that Apple has, they didn't actually spot, specify any of the type signatures on the other side of the thing, so I can't automatically generate the return type, so I'm going to have to specify that this block returns void. But otherwise, I know that it takes an ID, which is the object, it takes an NS U integer, which is the index, it takes also a Boolean pointer to whether it should stop or not. Uh, I'm going to system.print the object. Then if the object is 8, I'm going to set stop using pointer indirection equal to true. Then close that, close that. Syntax error, unexpected, parenthetical. Uh, did I not run? I did run that version of script. Okay. 
Oh, I forgot. That's not how you specify syntax. Um, there we go. That goes there. Okay, because you specify because you, you don't put a parentheses around the return type. The return type is just before the, the parentheses. Okay. There we go. Uh, and it prints seven eight because it stops at eight and doesn't go to hundred because we actually succeeded in, in implementing the stupid block protocol that has the boolean pointer and all that stuff. Uh, we can also call blocks. Um, although there is something currently a little bit weird with script calling blocks. I'm going to do a demonstration that's even in a way crazier where we're going to allocate a new class that takes a block as an argument and then we're going to call that. All right, so we're going to allocate a new, we're going to do a, an anonymous class that derives from NS object that is going to have an integer um, uh, message called test that takes an ID um, because blocks can kind of be IDs, um, which is block that is going to return uh, calling the block with five at end. We're going to pass it a block that returns an integer. No. Yes, it returns an integer and it's going to take an integer. And it's going to return value plus two. Close that and then close that. Seven. The hell is that compiling into? You don't even really want to know. Uh, it's compiling because it has to like at runtime uh, allocate a class pair and then add a bunch of uh, methods to it. It's, it's constructing all the type signatures. Uh, it's sending that final message, etc. But uh, demonstration, look, you can use blocks. They bridge in, in at least a reasonably awesome way. Okay. So I'm now going to run calculator. So one of the things that was, that was important with script is, is that you don't just want to be able to understand the frameworks, you want to understand how apps are built. So if I do script-p calculator, actually this is going to give an error, so this is actually useful to see. It's going to give me a crazy error because I, I have to run it as, as roots in order to get the permission required to do that injection. Um, you also could give the script binary, um, you could set GID it into the proc mod group on at least some versions of Mac that will work. Um, I, I have, I've actually tested though on all the versions that I earlier certified that root will work. Um, inside this app, I can now say nsapplication.sharedapplication.windows.title calculator is equal to hello and change the title of the calculator. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right. Oh, uh, this is actually kind of cool. Um, If you use the arrow operator, you can see all the fields that are in an object. Uh, that's oftentimes really useful when you're, when you're going through an object hierarchy. You've got like a controller, and the controller has a bunch of fields for all the subcontrollers that it's using, but doesn't actually expose messages for any of them. Um, you can just use the arrow operator and dive into the... Uh, all right, so for a second, I'm going to do something now on my iPhone. Springboard. Okay. UI app. Uh, UI app dot windows zero um, dot subviews zero subviews zero if you want window one that one is better subviews zero that's the wallpaper view icon content view looks good subviews icon scroll view subviews icon list view subviews icon view dot what kind of things you've got here? Yeah, you did. I thought you tell me what icon it was for. That's the application icon for mobile SMS. Okay. So, messages app there. That is jittering. True. Oh, that's actually a weird thing. Uh, kill all springboard. That was actually because I, I uh, this is this is an old demo that I, I was actually that that that's actually what I was about to demonstrate. <laughs> um, this is an interesting problem, isn't it? <laughs> I, uh, yeah. I'm gonna do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, turn off the passcode. General passcode lock. Is that recommended? 
No, it's not recommended. Unless, unless you don't keep your phone, uh, unless you keep your phone inside of you on stage the entire time. Okay, we have to wait for it to tether, and then it actually came back. Wow, I'm impressed. Okay, so app sub zero. Which one is this one now? Icon mobile SMS still. Okay. Uh, That is jittering true. Whoa. Did I verify? Did I tap and pretend or did I just let it say jittering? I mean, just out of curiosity, yes. No. Oh, I'm actually attached to the old copy of Springboard. Weirdly, that's a really weird thing. Okay. Oh, but you can't see this. <laughs> totally defeats the point. <laughs> okay. So now the icon is doing this little jittering thing. Uh, that is jittering. All right, so if I take an SB icon view, so in JavaScript, if you ask for the uh, constructor of something, you get its class. Um, so you get like the function that constructed it, which is kind of its class in prototype inheritance. Um, you can actually do that in, in Objective-C here as well. Um, I can also ask for, actually, if I ask for that, what am I going to get? I get an assignment. Yeah. Um, you can also ask for, okay, so if you have like a function uh, A, which has this dot, Mm, yeah, this dot b is equal to seven, and then you do new a, and you do now you get an object that has seven on it. When you construct it, when you call new on a function, it allocates a new object that whose constructor is that function. So if I say b dot constructor, I get back the function a, and it sets and it uses the this pointer then is set in the function to that object. If I then do a dot prototype dot q is equal to function return return this dot b and I now do b dot q it will walk up what is known as the prototype chain looking for the um, the, the things that I added so in this case the prototype um, the, the, the a constructor um, has q all of its children will have q and I constructed an object who's kind of a child of A, so it has Q. I can do something similar on the Objective C side using messages instead of prototypes. So if I go into uh, not bad SV icon view dot uh, messages of set is jittering colon dot, um, equals a function that will replace it, which will instead do this set alpha. Um, needs to take an argument set alpha, um, actually, by the way, first I'm going to make a backup copy of this. I'm just going to copy that message, right? All right, equals function value uh, this set alpha value question mark 0.51 syntax there. Uh, I forgot the close square bracket. Okay, debug mode is getting kind of confusing. All right. Um, and now I'm going to click and hold on an icon, and they're all going to fade out because I've replaced the functionality of that. I can bring them all back you know, by turning off the, uh, by hitting the home button. And I said, though, that I had a backup copy of that message. If I take that message and I call it, actually, I need uh, an icon. Here it is. A.call, and I pass that, and Pass yes. Uh, wait, undefined is not a function. Evaluating a dot. Um, this one, the one that takes that, undefined is not a function. A is that. A dot call isn't anything. A dot five. Oh, is this some really broken version of? A is my.
Maybe the one that's on the phone. The phone one always works. Ah, uh, call. Hey, well, this start of the demo failed. Ah! <laughs> okay. All right, so now I'm going to go into Xcode. Oh, actually, no. First, I'm going to switch over to the iOS simulator. All right, so back on my Mac. No, that's not my Mac. Back on my Mac now. I can do script-p springboard. Pseudo. And I get a prompt, which is now inside of springboard running in the simulator. And I should be able to do the exact same thing where I can say, uh, not that window. Whoa. If you crash the other process, bad things do tend to happen. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. Okay. Shouldn't be this bad though. Oh, because it's root. Whoa, here we go. Okay. And then there's this. Ah! Console should die now. There we go. UIAP.windows of zero dot subviews of and actually it's always the first one. I don't even bother with that. No, it's not. Maybe it's a similar difference. Sub zero. Not subviews of zero dot subviews of no of one. So I don't want to talk about subviews. Of zero. <laughs> okay, and set is Jittering, yes. What icon is this? Dot icon. It seems so simple to find. I almost tried to push my finger through my screen just now to see if this would actually. Uh, How do I hit the home button? I think maybe the earlier that I have to do it on the icon somehow? No, it's not on the icon. Ah. Huh. And this failed. You can see, though, clearly I'm in this process doing all sorts of cool things with tab completion, but you wonder why it's not. I'm sad. Whatever. All right, well, let's go to Xcode now and do the final demo. Okay, so here I have an Xcode project. Literally, all I did is I just did new Xcode project and I gave it a name. Okay, I didn't, I haven't, I haven't touched anything else in here. I just didn't want to spend all that time trying to do that part. Okay, so I'm going to click on. Uh, I'm going to use Xcode. Oh my god, I'm going to go way over here somehow. Targets, build phases, target dependencies, add. We're going. Uh, no. Huh. Is that, that's where I'm supposed to that, link libraries. Ah, okay, thank you. I, I, I seriously, for, this is the first time I used this was last night trying to figure out this demo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and so in here we're going to add JavaScript core, which is now should appear. Uh, if I just spin twice, it's a little bit scary. Uh, add one. <laughs> <laughs> And we need to add libspdc++ as well. Okay. And we're going to go into Finder. We're going to take the script framework, which should be in that zip file. We're going to drag it into the project. Uh, we're going to create folder references, I think. Okay. And now we're going to build project build. Let's see what kind of, if we get any errors just trying to do this. Don't we'll succeed. Okay. All right. Uh, now we're going to go try to find the where this app starts up. Okay. We're going to add an import for. Yeah. Maybe I should use these. I don't know what you think. H. 
And there's currently only one thing exported from that header file, which is CY. Oh no, it's autocompleting already. CY listen server 5432. Let's put in. I guess that's actually Postgres port. But whatever, I want Postgres running on my phone. Okay. Um, play. Succeeded. Be running in a second. As you can see, it's just a stupid default view that uh, that I get. And now we're going to do script dash r one seven two twenty ten dot one colon five four three two. And we'll connect into the now listening script port sitting inside of my app. And UI app. Ta-da. So, okay. Why might this be useful? Uh, one thing that's useful for this is if you're interested in seeing how um, an application that you can get into the simulator that like Apple ships, how, how a little bit how it works, you can do that. Um, also, if you're just trying to explore something in UIKit, this can be a really cool way of, of like seeing it run as you use it. Um, the uh, debug window, like the immediate debug console in the debugger, provides some of these features, but it's not able to like dynamically construct classes so easily and manipulate them with categories and swap out native code for, for JavaScript code and do all the stuff that we've been showing. Um, additionally, it can be, and from that perspective, then it can also be helpful. So if you're in the debugger and you have uh, an address, and you're also connected in with scripts. You might use the debugger to get a breakpoint. And then you know there's something wrong with this object. You then can let your program run. Because normally when the debuggers, when you're using the debugger, the program is stopped. When you're using script, the program is still going. You go into script, you can say new instance, give it this uh, pointer, and it will wrap it correctly into something you can now use with script. So um, you can kind of like in tandem use the debugger and the And script <laughs> in order in order to debug your project. Um, there are other things that I think would be kind of interesting to do with script, um, but I have no idea whether or not people would actually be interested in using them. So um, one thing is to provide a um, superior JavaScript Objective C bridging support. Um, but there are various reasons why people might not want to bother getting that from me anymore. Um, <laughs> there's uh, uh, trying to do um, uh, running uh, uh, actual writing an app in script. Um, to, a, to a large extent, the syntax you have in script is so similar to Objective-C, you don't necessarily buy anything. Um, but there might be some cool benefits of being able to do like an offline cached app. Uh, it does run in JavaScript core, which is at least, um, I, I, so they, I, I don't know if it's public. I think it should be public. They've got this thing, you go to WDC, and you get to actually ask an App Store advisor whether or not something is legit. And I asked them about doing that sort of stuff, and the guy was like, yeah, the intention should be that any JavaScript you can get running using anything that's public is fine. Um, so if you had a public JavaScript core, that would be fine. Uh, <laughs> uh, which maybe we, maybe we will. Um, and uh, some people have thought about using this to do like tiny little back patching on a, pro on a program. Like you've got a program that, that's got like one little tiny bug in it. If only you could get it to just download a tiny little bit of JavaScript that could change a little bit of its behavior. Again, these are all little bit sketchy use cases that if anyone was actually interested in, I would be happy to talk to them about. Um, but I use it mostly for um, spelunking and debugging. Uh, any questions? This is, yeah, so what, um, what I was just doing with Xcode works on a non-jailbroken device. Um, and most of what I've been showing you was done with the iOS simulator or on my Mac. Um, there was only one demo I tried to do um, on my jailbroken phone just to show you that the simulator worked the same as the phone. Any other questions? Yes. Can you shoot in events? Uh, yes, um, but you're going to have, I mean, if you go into UI app, there, uh, yeah, that is UI app, uh, handle, handle event, you can just kind of declare a UI event and kind of send it in there. Like, it's just, there's just some private APIs you can use to simulate events in UI app. So yes, you can, you can do that. So automated testing is something I've thought about also with uh, using script for. Any other questions? Yes. You, you could, and that almost certainly, so the, um, you, 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 could, you could ship an app that doesn't use any private APIs and somehow like secretly try to use script to do so. Um, I, I doubt that they would like that. <laughs> uh, yes? Uh, 
So the question is trying to like defend against scripts. So, so last year I gave a, um, a talk about server-side platforms that would allow you to be able to write programs that have databases, but you don't have any actual middleware code. Um, things like StackMob, Parse, Firebase, etc. Um, showing that a lot, um, a lot if certainly if you just read the tutorials that any of them have, you end up with a horribly insecure app because they always are trying to onboard you so quickly and they don't care about you, you know, because it looks hard. Security is hard. Security, honestly, if you don't have middleware, is harder than if you have middleware and they don't want that to, to, to feel really hard. And so, um, but of course, middleware, it's a trade-off because middleware itself is hard. Uh, you have to have servers, you got to run, you got to maintain, you got to administrate them. It's an interesting trade-off. I'm not saying it's a bad trade-off, I'm just saying it's, it's a trade-off. Um, and so, if you, uh, what I did last year is I kind of took some apps that were using one of the really large providers, like that was listed on their web page, um, and I was just, I was, I was showing like anonymized data that I pulled from it that was just horrendously scary. And so it's like you just kind of go into the app and you're just like using its object model to like defeat the, defeat it. Um, you, you really kind of can't protect against that because the pr the code has to run on the phone. And if you have the ability to get access to that code and run it, it doesn't even have to run on the phone. I mean, you can take the code that would have been on the phone and run it in an emulator on a computer. You're not going to know the difference. And if you, can, if you can tell the difference, then I just patch your code to not care. <laughs> and, and then I keep going. Um, so you're, you're really screwed. I mean, you can try to obfuscate things. Um, so like a, a, a thing I, I sometimes will describe. So there was a, a key that, I, that was in a, like a... An SSL private certificate, private certificate that was in the HBO application for localhost. Like VeriSign apparently even like it's a valid CA valid like localhost private certificate that was inside the HBO app and somebody else had noticed it and they just kind of mentioned it and then, then they went to lunch and I was like, oh, I want to see that certificate. And he's, he's at lunch. So I'll just, I'll just try to like pull it out. So I like sit there, I'm like sitting there disassembling through the binary and I'm like trying to figure, it took me two hours and I finally figured out they had a string which was like garbage percentage at garbage, percentage at garbage. They then did a format of that, taking two other strings, putting it in there. They took the result, they basically before decoded it. Maybe there was like even another step with some XO or something. And then the result of that was the password that was used to decrypt the uh, key bag that was stored in the binary, which I could just see running strings. Like you just, you see all those little strings and suddenly you see this massive base 64 encoded block. I'm like, that's the key bag. Um, and when I, and the, the password was, Amsterdam is cold. Uh, with a zero for the O and like a four for the A or something, right? Um, it took me two hours to do this, and I and I and I and I said to the guy like, because it didn't seem like it took him two hours. And he's like, why did you spend two hours doing that? I just used your stuff. <laughs> I took the thing that decoded the password, and I just saw what the password like like the thing that took the password as an argument, and I found out what the password was. And I was like, oh, I just felt so stupid at that moment. <laughs> but um. Yeah, the best thing you can do is, is you can just try to obfuscate stuff. But I mean, we, um, like script starts to become irritating to use if all of your objects are named like A and a number. Uh, like not object, like classes are named like, you know, A1, A2, A3, A4. Um, but the, to some extent, you can't really do that because you're using a lot of public APIs from Apple. And, and so, yeah, I, I just kind of, don't put code on my device that you don't want me to see. <laughs> if there's code on my device you don't want me to see, you have already lost. <laughs> Uh, any other questions? Yes. I don't even know what that is. If that if that is an Objective C API, you could call it from script. I don't know. <laughs> you might be able to put JavaScript in a string and then call it from script. <laughs> In essence, what I've done is I've constructed a really fancy Objective-C interpreter. Uh, I, I've actually spent some time always trying to like get it to quine. Like, like if, if there's some syntax that C++ has, I'll try to add it. Like, if you say auto t is equal to seven, it'll compile to var t is equal to seven. And that way, I, I, I really wanted to have this dream that I'd have this one file that was like a tiny sample program. If you compiled it in Objective-C++ or ran it with script, you'd get the same result. So, yes. Oh, you're, you're just telling me time's up. Okay. <laughs> no more questions. <laughs> we're, we're over. I don't know. Okay. <laughs>